So everybody's in. Okay. All right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, this is the Northampton Planning Board meeting of uh, uh, January 26, 2022. My name is George Kohat. I'm the chair of the planning board. Um, there's nobody in the public audience, but we do have some folks here joining us through Zoom. Um, prior to opening up the, the meeting, this is basically going to be a discussion about some issues that the planning board faces um, during the application processes. Um, relevant to some of the new ordinances that have come um, through the city council for the city lately. Um, topics such as, um, you know, certainly uh, affordable housing, uh, the lack thereof, um, housing in general in the city. Also, some of the constraints on builders um, in terms of a lot, uh, many items, the uh, costs of building materials and some of the city's um, progressive moves around fossil fuels. So the, the planning board wants to have an opportunity to talk about those among themselves. And at one point, we will certainly take comments from the general public, probably through chat, that then Carol and Miss, our staff, will read aloud to the planning board, um, and we'll entertain those later on. Um, so I want to take the opportunity. We have someone else joining us from the planning office here. Um, Nathan, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Nathan Chung. Um, I'm currently the grants administrator for the city of Northampton. And uh, next week, I'll be uh, starting the position as the land use planner um, in the same office. So I'm uh, basically attending this meeting to learn about the process and to support uh, you and uh, Carolyn. So very Great. nice to meet you. Great. Welcome, Nathan. Nice to meet you, too. Um, so we're, there's four members of the planning board here is, and I don't have a laptop, I can't see the participant list. Is anybody in the planning board um, here via Zoom? Um, yes, Chris Tate is on Zoom. Hello, Chris. Good to see you, buddy. Um, so we are five. Okay. Um, so before we open up the discussion, we, we traditionally have a period of public comment. Um, if there's anyone who has an item they'd like to raise, ooh, there are no applications in front of us, but a, a comment you'd like to raise for the planning board at this point, um, please um, raise your hand on Zoom or, well, there's nobody here, come to the podium. Right, we're doing chat on Zoom. Chat, oh, that's right. I don't see. Okay, great. So then let's open up this discussion. Um, and a, a quick announcement, we are recording this. Um, this there is a video recording of the, the meeting and uh, also the items that may come up through chat. Um, so just so everyone's aware of that. Um, so today the board wants to take on a, a few items to discuss. Some of this has been raised by the working group of the uh, city council, which is called the community resources work group. They've had a couple of public meetings, informational sessions that have brought in um, outside experts around real estate, construction, um, affordable housing, um, topics like that. Last week, just this week, the tree warden came in to talk a little bit about uh, the tree ordinances and the importance of trees in our community. Um, and he was joined by a, a woman who does a lot of work with affordable housing and design and build an architect who spoke really well about that. So um, some of the members of the planning board attended those meetings um, and they were very helpful for this fellow. Um, for the past couple of years, we've been dealing with certainly housing applications um, that have come before us that have caused uh, a discussion in the community, let's say. So um, I, Carolyn and I had a discussion about bringing this forward to the board just to have that discussion when we're not faced with kind of the, not the pressure, but the immediacy of a, a specific application to talk more in generalities about what some of our ordinances um, are hoping to see the city uh, developing and uh, some of the um, 
national and state trends that are happening and how it impacts our role as a planning board here in the community. Um, one of them that's come up, uh, of course, across the state and here is the notion of inclusionary zoning, um, which many of the planning boards have heard about. It's a, it's a, and I'll let Carolyn talk about this much more in a learned experience, experience way than myself. Uh, but another way in that uh, incentivizes um, builders, developers to include affordable housing in a multi-unit kind of development. Um, so I, we, I just want to understand and make sure that the planning board understands um, the pros and cons of an inclusionary zoning approach, which Northampton does not have at this point, but other communities do. Um, Carolyn, would you mind giving a brief overview of that? And sure. Um, so inclusionary zoning typically refers to um, a zoning that actually requires a portion of a projects or a development to include um, deed restricted sub, um, affordable housing and affordable housing, again, meaning um, those who are income eligible and not earning more than 80% of the area median income would qualify for those units. Um, and um, so that's a very um, specific um, targeted population. The city actually has taken a different approach for decades um, by uh, providing more of an incentive based instead of, um, uh, what do you call that? Between carrots and sticks. And so, um, and that being through the cluster development um, zoning as well as subdivision ordinances, um, there is an incentive for additional units if you include a certain number of affordable units within a project. So there have been a couple of developments that have proceeded using that incentive to include affordable housing. Um, however, they haven't been successful in that they, it, um, the idea is that you're spreading the cost of building those affordable units that are targeted towards people who don't pay the same um, um, uh, costs as the market rate unit buyers do. And so you have to spread, I mean, the cost is the same, but the payment by the end user is not the same. So you have to spread the cost of the development of the affordable housing units across all the units in the project in order to make the bottom line work out for a developer, right? And it takes an enormous number of units to spread out. So the most recent um, project that we, um, uh, that um, availed itself of that incentive was Emerson Way. And you all have, um, whatever iteration of the planning board there is over the last 20 years has seen Emerson Way at various phases. And that was going to be eight units um, of affordable housing as part of an overall 64 unit subdivision. Um, that project is not panning out because those 64 units could not um, uphold and carry the costs for those eight affordable units. So it's been extremely difficult for the developer to be able to balance those sheets and they have lost money on the affordable units. And so we have an example, a clear example of um, that not working in Northampton, um, even as an incentive approach. And so there have been from time there's been from time to time over the decades, um, especially with the housing partnership, they've talked a lot about having, you know, mandatory inclusionary zoning. Typically, um, what you see is um, in the eastern part of the state, um, where there's hundreds of units being built at one time on a project, there might be a mandatory inclusionary zoning that says, okay, 10% of the units you're building have to be dedicated and deed restricted as affordable units. Um, those developers who are building 300 units at a time can better balance the cost across the 10% of those units. You know, if it's just going to be, um, you know, 320, whatever units, they can do that um, because of the scale of the project. 
Um, that hasn't really been the case in Western Mass. It's very hard to, um, and so that's basically the private sector building the affordable housing. And what works in our area because of both scale, um, you know, the construction costs are the same, but we don't have the same return rate for um, housing. So we can't, they can't balance the sheet out the way you can in, in, in places where um, the housing market is much different and stronger. Um, so we haven't uh, um, gone down that road of requiring, um, you know, mandatory inclusionary housing and, and have tried to take the incentive approach. And then also looking at, as you know, trying to create different opportunities for different types of housing. Maybe it's not, sub, you know, maybe it's not subsidized affordable housing, but it's uh, more market rate, afford what we call market rate affordable housing. Um, but the conversation is still ongoing. Um, I think there's still people who think that um, if we say it, the housing will come. Um, but it's it's a very um, difficult calculus to make. And I think we're we're what we're trying to do is just create opportunities for the affordable housing developers, the nonprofit affordable housing developers who do the stuff in their sleep, <laughs> provide opportunities for those things, those um, projects to happen. And then provide incentives to private developers to be able to build, um, you know, uh, those um, lower end market rate units, if that makes sense. Um, I think Amherst has um, tried um, to have mandatory inclusionary housing. I don't know that it's, I don't know the success rate of that. Yeah. <clears throat> The, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're in such a <clears throat> an interesting time when it comes to real estate in Northampton and the East and, and I think in the nation. Uh, it, you know, uh, we often hear during our applications when um, applications come before us in neighborhoods. If it's a private venture, those starter homes are really not doable, um, given the price of uh, an empty lot or a lot, given the price of what they're paying for a home, um, given the price of renovation, they can't build homes and make any kind of reasonable profit at that rate of $200,000, $250,000. Um, to me, it seems like starter homes <clears throat> in any kind of affordable range for um, uh, are really in condo arrangements. Um, a young couple can buy a condo at Damon Road or up at Yankee Hill for 180,000, still 200,000. It's not a single family home, but it's their home and they can hopefully um, or, um, develop some equity out of that. Um, but it's more and more difficult for a a uh, working family, a young family to get a, a single family home. And back 20 years ago when the state hospital was being developed, I know there was a great hope that there would be workforce housing there, which would be in the $200,000, $250,000, and that didn't really materialize either. Um, so it's just been very, very difficult. And we've heard pretty clearly from builders and real estate agents why that is today. COVID hasn't helped things for sure. Um, pipeline problems haven't helped things in terms of construction, but um, that's where we are. So developers who do come in with applications are often, as is evidence, do a recent application we okayed down on William Street. It's for four units, but they'll end up, I think, costing about um, for the new owner $400,000, $450,000, um, which again is, is out of the range of most, a lot of families who are just starting out. Other people's ideas about inclusionary zoning or the incentives we offer or kind of the dilemma we're in. I guess, is there any, I guess I was asking George this informally before we started, but is there, has there been any discussion? I mean, is there something that we're just curious about or there's not, is there any specific momentum around this? that we're discussing it now or just generally because we've had these issues with people saying they want more smaller homes or something? 
Yeah, a good question, David. There's nothing in my mind. I've just heard <clears throat> people asking me privately about inclusionary zoning and would that help our situation? Um, but as Carolyn said, I often tell them we're just not at that scale of housing mm -hmm. um, to do that. Um, if you remember uh, back about two, three, three years ago, we had a an application for a large apartment building on South Street. You know, that was going to be 16 or 20 apartments, I believe. Um, but even those were going to be at a, at a fairly high rate. Um, I don't think we were able at that point to ask that developer um, to, to, to mandate any kind of affordable affordability there. Um, so, so no, to, um, to directly answer your question, there's nothing coming from city council or the mayor's office around inclusionary zoning, but I just wanted to air that because I've heard it from a number of people and I've tried to explain it as well as I could, but uh, um, in case other board members had heard of that too, so. Yeah, I think the other, I think um, occasionally at hearings, people say, why can't you require one of these units to be affordable? Um, and um, the code doesn't require it, but the reason why the code doesn't require it is because it's really, um, you know, as I said, the scale doesn't make, even if you had 13 units and you asked one of them, I mean, you know, now Laura Baker's saying for them, for the affordable yes. housing units, it costing, it's costing them $500,000 um, um, $500, per unit to build. So basically, if you translate that to a 16 unit project, now the, um, the developer is, you know, um, being asked to put five hundred thousand dollars. Essentially, you know, if you take that equation, five hundred thousand dollars on the table um, to dedicate for something, and then it's not just that one instance, but it has to be managed over time. And there's an administrative cost to ensuring that that rolls over. You know, the first buyer or renter comes in. There's a tail to that, you know, you have to, if it's deed restricted, there's someone that has to oversee that the next person also gets the benefit of that affordability restriction and, and so forth. So that it's not just the upfront cost, which is tremendous, but it has, you know, it lasts forever, essentially. And so when you're just doing a one-off within a building, you know, it's very, it's, it's hard to manage that way too. Um, and then the, the other thing that comes up, I think that you hear a lot is uh, along those lines, why can't you require it's affordable and none of these are going to be affordable. And I think there's still sort of a misunderstanding of what that term affordable means and that it's not, I mean, a lot of these homes that are coming, you know, um, people can't conceive of the fact that they themselves could opt to buy them because they're out of their price range and therefore they're not affordable to them. But that is different from the definition of affordable housing. And um, so um, that piece of trying to make it affordable for a large part of the population um, is the other piece of the regulations that we're trying to address through um, reducing the impediments for new units, creating more opportunities for different types <clears throat> of arrangements for housing on lots, allowing smaller units or an incentive for smaller units so you could potentially build more so that then people could see themselves being able to afford those new units coming on board. Right, right. So then we bounce into this neighborhood character. If a developer says, okay, I will build a triplex here, a three unit building. Well, it's going to be a larger scale. Probably um, it's not going to fit in with a, a neighborhood of single family homes. Um, and that, so we're asking that neighborhood to sacrifice what they thought was their historical neighborhood to allow for, you know, a, a larger building to accommodate more people, perhaps at a lower price point too. Um, you know, we we I don't think we've seen that yet. We've seen smaller homes built two to a two to a lot at times, but even then, I think we see when somebody builds two homes under our new ordinances. Often that home is pretty big. We didn't put any cap on a square foot for the cost of those homes. Um, so people think, well, what's that have to do with affordable housing? How's that helping the city? Um, and to me, it helps the city because we're adding to the stock of housing. So if somebody buys that house, you know, they're moving up, um, they've got the equity to do that. 
hopefully they're vacating a house and selling a house at a different price point for somebody else who's just building their equity. Um, nationally, I, I think this is huge. I don't see, I know I've, I've heard that the feds and the state are going to put a lot of money into housing. Um, I don't think we've seen that yet. And I don't know if it'll be incentives for private builders more than it will be for uh, the CDCs of the world and larger affordable. Putting a lot of money into the housing is not a recipe for lowering the cost of housing. No. It's just a, it's going to create more housing inflation. Could you explain that a little bit more? Pour a billion dollars into housing doesn't magically create a billion more electricians, right? Like everyone who's making housing, I mean, that yeah. seems to be the critical bottleneck in creating housing is like the people out there make housing the material, the cost of materials, and <clears throat> just stretch the labor force thinner, and they can charge more. And uh -huh. I mean, good, we should all like tell our kids to go <laughs> become plumbers and electricians and things, yeah. but. uh yeah, I don't know. It's a it's a it's a tough problem to have, although much more preferable than like uh, being a very poor country with cheap housing. I think it's better to be a rich country with expensive housing. Why people True. like to move to this country? True. Uh, yeah. It'd be nice to be rich with cheap housing, but I don't know that any countries have that. <laughs> you know, the other thing I think you guys have talked about and it's come up in hearings is what is that? You know what is the character of neighborhoods in Northampton and the, and the thing that is um, likable about N Northampton and what's potentially unique about Northampton is the fact that there isn't a single type of block or neighborhood and that there is variety within neighborhoods of housing type, housing unit, no, total number of units. So even if a triplex um, is developed in one on one parcel, does that really mean that it's changing the character of that neighborhood? Because if you take two steps back, three steps back, and you look around, there are three plexes and you know different configurations. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but sometimes that's hard to see when you're focused on one parcel. I think it's um yeah, I've been a builder for 35 years, you know, and so it's it's a complex situation. Um, COVID didn't make it any better. I thought that the the people that spoke at those last two uh, meetings with the um, community resources group, yep. I thought that they really, in a very sober way, explained the the challenges that we're facing as a building community. But so much of what we discuss is subjective. Uh, we have codes that are somewhat objective. But so much of what we discuss is what is the character of a neighborhood. One person's definition of that character is not the same as the next person's. And a lot of times I see those um, great old photographs of Northampton on Facebook from like 100 years ago. And it'll show a neighborhood in Florence or a neighborhood downtown. And it looks nothing like it does today. Nothing. So there was you know, 250 little steps that got from the way it looked 100 years ago to now. And there's no reason to think that that's not just going to really continue to, to happen. Um, I mean, my own parents were having to deal with ha somebody putting a second unit, their neighbor putting a second unit on their property, and they didn't like it. And I understood that. But it was giving the neighbor the opportunity to do exactly what we're trying to do and create more housing. We have a housing deficit. We're trying to create housing in a lot of different ways. Um, and, and I recently had to move and I wasn't planning on it. And I recently, and, and by me moving, there was a couple that had been waiting for a house for like three years with their two kids and they couldn't wait to get in there. They were thrilled. And you know, it's kind of the nature of the beast. Um, and we used to be able to build for, you know, $100 a square foot. That was a long time ago. But even building a 900 square foot ranch, you know, at $1,000 or, a, you know, $100 a square foot, um, or two, now, right now, $250 a square foot is also days of old. Wow. So a 900 square foot ranch costing somewhere in the low 200s 
it's just impossible to do. Right now we're running at construction costs of, you know, four to five hundred dollars a square foot. So <clears throat> subjective. Is that house affordable? That house is affordable to some people. It's clearly not affordable to others, but it's it's not that that's totally different than what we're classifying affordable. Um, and I have also done a lot of estimating for some of these affordable housing projects and on the money, $500,000 a unit. The only way they can build them is because they're getting all, you know, monies. It, there's just, they're more expensive to build than other properties. Right. So it really is a very complex kind of Rubik's cube of issues that are happening. And um, it's great hearing from everybody in the neighborhoods. It's really great. Um, but we do, we do have to sort of take a step back and look at what we're trying to accomplish here as a city. Yeah. Um, there is one comment in the chat. Okay. If you're ready for that. We'll or listen. You... Yeah. Um, this is from, um, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, to see Gastonge. Many of the homes that come up for sale in Northampton could be starter homes if the city wouldn't let developers, especially Hansel, destroy them and the trees around them and then put up monstrous expensive condos instead. Many of our older, smaller homes could be great starter homes if you let individuals and families purchase them instead of the developer who is at this meeting. Why aren't you inviting open public comment at the beginning of this meeting? Hello, Tusi. Thanks for your comment. Um, we did have pu a public comment period before we opened up the hearing. Um, we asked people if they wanted to, to to chat. There's nobody in the audience who came to the podium, but but thanks. We did offer that. Um, I'm sure you missed it. Um, in, in regards to your question about um, developers buying homes, again, you know, this is uh, a free market. Somebody, we all know that homes are a price is put out there on the realtor's list. People bid on that. The, the house goes to the highest bidder. Um, a homeowner, if he or she would like to, could refuse that bid and give it to another lower bid because they like that family. Um, but that's very unusual. Um, so those homes that are being sold by our neighbors, you know, they're trying to get the best that they can at this point, the best um, price for their equity. Um, so they can do other things. We can't dictate who homes are sold to or the price of homes that they're sold to. Um, that just doesn't happen here in Northampton or anywhere else, I don't think, in America. Anybody else want to respond to that comment? Um, I'll, I'll say that it, there's not as as many people looking to buy and renovate homes now either. I mean, houses go on the market that are, uh, you know, fixer-uppers need a lot of work. And anybody's got a shot at them and um you know it, it's not as easy to um to make that work financially now with the cost of 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 building so i i i don't know this as a fact but i'm assuming that there are less people bidding for those than maybe there were 2 years ago and and the price per square foot is the same yeah. you're dealing with so yeah. even if you buy a fixer up or Sometimes it's more. I mean, as somebody who's been dealing with something like mold, I can tell you that getting an older home that's maybe had some deferred maintenance going on, that's had leaks in it or has a wet basement, and you try and, and renovate that into something that's livable um, and that's safe, you can spend more doing a renovation than yep. a new build. Yep. Thank you. Um, this is a, a good place maybe to segue into this piece of the, the other piece that makes construction expensive now too is a community like ours. We're asking um, developers, builders for new construction to be really mindful about kind of the energy um, around our, our net zero programming. Um, so Carolyn, do you, would you just give us a quick little summary about where the city is with 
those. Sure. We, we, you know, as the, the advo advocacy continues for trying to um, electrify buildings and push that um, through in any code manner that's possible, um, in Massachusetts, the zoning code cannot overstep the bounds of the building code. And so it's not through zoning that, I mean, it's really the, the the purview of the building code. And that's addressed not in Northampton, but we have the state building code. And um, there are there is action at the state level. And we just, I think, just have the new building code. And David can um, probably speak to that a little bit more. Um, but sort of on the zoning side, to skirt that or to attempt to skirt that, the zoning has been amended to essentially cloak it in an incentive. And so if the board is giving an incentive for a unit, and um, then um, the board could require um, all electric utilities, so or fossil fuel free um, utilities. Um, However, you know, that that took some massaging of the language to be in the um, zoning um, that way. Um, and we still don't know if, the, you know, it's there and we're requiring that of people. But the bottom line is it really is a building code issue. And, and we're also working on that front. We meaning collectively people in the Commonwealth. And so the next iteration of the building code has different standards now to meet certain energy um, thresholds. And you can do that by going all electric or you can do that by other means, but there's sort of an, a pick list, an option, depending on what kind of project you have. There is also a push to um, for Northampton to become an opt-in municipality to do um, a stretch energy code, stretch the new, plus. Right, the new version, right. No, but even beyond that. So, um, and that would have to be then adopted by city council as the co as the new building code, but it does put a financial, it, it changes the calculus in some situations and it would also be affect renovation. So if you're a single family home owner or you own a duplex and you need to upgrade your furnace because it's dead in the middle of winter. And then all of a sudden you're told well, you're going to have to change your whole system because now we have this new code. Um, you know, that's something that's going to be debated as to at what point that becomes, um, you know, um, implemented and, and affected. So that is def. I mean, all of those conversations are um, on the right now happening um, relative to the building code. So you're going to see that probably coming, popping to the forefront. And um, the Energy and Sustainability Commission is certainly pushing to have the city consider, and the, some, there are a couple of city councilors who are working on code, um, an ordinance to um, opt in to this um, specialized um, code. Um, but it'll be part of the public conversation and it's outside of zoning. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that Northampton, like there's like a tradition of like, we're Northampton, we have to go out and show everyone, you know, what Cambridge couldn't do or whatever. But I think um, on electrification specifically, we put ourselves at a huge risk if we do not stick with where the state or the regional power distribution is because we do not want to find out on a negative 10 degree day that we've overdone it on electrification and there's like 50 percent of our houses can't heat themselves like not a good idea you know we should be going along with the regional power authorities to make sure that the grid can handle what we want to happen and that's the way to world electrification not like one town deciding yeah, because we don't generate the power here, even if we have a lot of solar panels. Right. That, that doesn't get you from negative 10 to 70 degrees. <laughs> well, it's also still a dirty grid, right, is what they call it. it. Will, yes, <laughs> yes. So, yes. but the idea really is if you're going to replace your, you know, if you're going to be replacing a system, that's a once every, well, now it's down to probably 15 years. It used to be 30 or 40 years. but 
you know, if you don't do it now, then the next time you're going to do it is 15 years from now. And so have you lost that? you know, those years in between. And so I think that's the balance is to say, well, if you're going to be making this investment as a renovation, you know, in your home, for example, or building new, um, you know, and the grid suddenly gets better, not suddenly, but finally, you know, we reach a point where it's much cleaner in seven or eight years, but you still have your system that you invested, haven't gotten your return. Um, So that's the reason for, you know, getting people in the door now. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And I think it also, th- there's a piece about the city's own goal of carbon neutrality mm-hmm. by 2030. For city, for municipal operations for and municipal buildings. Operations. Yeah. And 2050 for the for, community. For the community. Right. So, and how do we get there? We all realize that that's a very important piece for right. our, our planet. How do we get there? Can we do it if we, if we continue to rely on fossil fuels, um, older homes that are uninsulated so yeah there's a that kind of subtle pressure too that that's moving us forward so and and your point i think is somewhat analogous to our our national push now to sell and buy electric cars and the people's fear that the grid of course isn't ready for that um and how do we get the grid to a place where there's enough charging stations and enough robustness for all of my neighbors to have those you know tier three charges on their on their garages um so people are nervous about getting electric cars because the grid isn't compatible yet um, to that i think you know the other night um dory brooks was talking about um you know the differences between renovating and building new and how the building code you know you have this really tight envelope and it's much easier to meet all of those standards with new construction and she was talking about the renovation costs and how even you can put so much money into renovating but you're not you're still not going to get to that and that there's so there's the other piece about electrification but also reduction right so reducing the your use and you can do that by through insulation but you can only do so much of that in an existing home but but your point is every you know we need to try sort of all of these strategies and um because one there's not gonna be one magic bullet and we have so much housing stock anyway (laughs) um that it's going to take time. And so to the extent that we can push what we can now um, um, is, I think, the goal. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have another chat question. You'd like um, me to read it? Sure, please do. Um, whoops, sorry. This is... Um, Sorry, from Nan Smith, I think. Uh, Would stricter ordinances against teardowns of single-family homes help give people a shot at fixer-uppers? They won't likely be capable of outbidding a contractor, question mark. That would allow greater inclusion. Can you read that again? Would stricter ordinances against, or so prohibiting teardowns of single family homes help give people a shot at fixer uppers? They won't likely be capable of outbidding a contractor, question mark. That would allow greater inclusion. So I think you answered that a little bit with your, you know, about dictating who buys and not. But that also came up the other night um, about, the disincentive, I mean, so the, the total cost of meeting building codes for older homes, so fixing up older homes, um, there isn't a built-in um, acknowledgement of the embedded carbon and the value that that has for older homes. And so when you put all the um, variables on the table, Dory Brooks was saying that um, that's when you come to a conclusion much more quickly that it's um, more cost effective to demolish in some cases than to renovate because you're going to have such a high cost to meet the current building codes. And so again, sort of zoning ordinances don't address demolitions. Um, It's really a building code issue. And again, we can't legislate who buys a home from somebody who has their home up for sale 
Um, we can't portion 10% of all um, real estate sales will be to individual homeowners rather than somebody who might have a, a, a builder single outside or on their truck. Um, it just doesn't work that way. Um, also, like we should acknowledge also like that there's an experiential difference. If you live in a neighborhood and the house next to you sells for $200,000 to some young family, and then over the next three years, they put their $200,000 of their own money into it and build an addition and make it look real nice. It's real cute. But if a developer buys it for $200,000 and builds a new house for $400,000 and sells it to somebody from New York, it feels real bad. And it's the same outcome. And if you move into that neighborhood two years later, you probably would never know the difference. But if you live through that, I mean, I think we can acknowledge that like that's a different experience for the neighborhood. But I think going back to like neighborhood character, like these are strong neighborhoods that will survive that kind of, um, you know, momentary disruption. And I think like we've seen Bay State and I think even William Street will survive, you know. Yep. I mean, there's there's stuff in the Gazette from the 80s of William Street, like uh, character being destroyed by something that was turned into a condo back then, and and William Street didn't just de get destroyed. So I don't think it invalidates people's feelings about it because mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it feels hard. Yep. But like people will survive. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay, doke. All right. Well, those are a couple of things. You know, we haven't been at this a long time yet, but those are a couple of things that have come up in the past year, uh, two years around many of the applications that have come in front of us. Um, and I just personally wanted to have a time to kind of talk through those um, without having the applicant or the neighborhood right here um, and being faced with kind of our own decision on that. Um, it's very helpful. Um, and I'm, I'm just struck how Northampton is not doing this alone. Every community is faced with these kind of ha this housing dilemma, these uh, construction. Um, <clears throat> Northampton has a problem with people who are unhoused on our city streets. Um, I wish there was housing for all of those. Um, you know, that, uh, that would certainly go a long way in helping that situation downtown and in other cities. Um, but but how we get there, I'm not sure with a huge influx of of federal dollars. And I think, as David rightly put it, all of a sudden you just can't um, have this building boom without the conduit of supplies and tradesmen to do that. Um, yeah, we don't, uh, the planning board doesn't get into our unhoused uh, situation and dilemma in Northampton, um, but certainly that's a, a big <clears throat> One of the issues that's faced by our downtown um, is, you know, how we are dealing, um, how long that, say, the resiliency center is taking to come online and what happens there and uh, the support services for people. But, boy, if we had just more housing that was affordable and that people could move into and, you know, live by themselves, small studios, I think it would go a long way in, in really uh, mitigating some of that. But um, we're not there yet, for sure. I also add, um, I'm, I'm the person who goes to the PBPC meetings from this committee, and uh, and they're doing like a strategic, they're doing like a strategic plan to figure out how to do a strategic plan. Is from what I can understand is what they're doing right now. But um, in any event, I think the lack of regional planning that exists in basically New England, but definitely in Massachusetts. I mean, to be honest, like we look at affordable housing if it's in the square of Northampton, but if we go over one of those lines, it's not affordable. And we have pretty good affordable housing or, or subsidized housing numbers, I should say. I wouldn't say we have good affordability, but when you look at the entire Pioneer Valley, you know, we do have a huge range of different housing types, and there's plenty of housing in many of the communities very close to here where you can do those things. And just because it's not in Northampton doesn't mean our community doesn't have housing. Of, I, I would encourage the PVPC to help the different towns think more regionally, which there's a lot of uh, resistance to for good reasons, I guess. But, you know, I, I think it's kind of it's kind of silly that we only look to the, our borders. Right, <laughs> right, right. No, and, and that's very true. David uh, <clears throat> referenced the PVC, PVPC, which is the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. 
um, because often I think that's really a good point. Many of these issues are <clears throat> regionally based, and Northampton has done a good job of taking on some of those um, pressures, I think, from other communities. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a regional thing that needs to be addressed regionally, whether it's <clears throat> housing or trans better transportation, um, health services, things of that nature. Yeah. All righty. Other kind of topics that once in a while when we finish a meeting, a planning board meeting, um, the application, the applicants have gone away. We say to Carolyn, hey, how about this or how about that? And we talk a little bit off the record. I don't know if there's any other larger issues that folks would like to explore at a future date, um, such as these housing ones. Um, we hear a lot lately about certainly the the moans and groans that I feel very closely about trees being removed in order to have a building put up or in order to do solar. That's a real tricky one. Um, again, and there's really merit on both sides of that equation. Um, you know, Northampton has done a great job in terms of trying to rebuild its urban tree canopy. It's going to take years for these small trees that we see on the city streets to kind of provide that shade and carbon sequestration that we want, but it's coming. Um, and again, that that sometimes is a very tough thing for a neighborhood to lose trees or specific neighbors to lose trees. But, um, you know, we take that case by case when an application comes in front of us. I know Rich Parasoletti was at the meeting the other day and spoke about that. And he's had some very, who's the tree ward in Northampton and has some very interesting situations. Um, just recently, we saw in the Gazette where a gentleman wants to take down a city tree because it's threatening his home. And, you know, the city doesn't really want to do that. And that's the reverse side of whereas a city wants to take down a tree for such and such purpose. And the residents say, no, no, you can't take that down. Um, much like the Mary Maple next door in Amherst, you know, those are all tough things when we get to love a tree. So. You know, we uh, we look at those, the Northampton Tree Ordinance um, at times, and I think there's some conversation with the uh, um, the Tree Commission. I forget it's a fissil title, you know, about looking at those and over time and seeing if they need revision. So there are distinct ordinances sometimes that um, the city council or other boards are looking at to make sure that they're up to date with what's happening in our world. The trees are one of them. Um, lighting is another one. Sometimes we go through lighting reviews here with large applications. I'm not very versed in that. David, as an architect, or maybe Melissa, with your experience, is a little bit more um, up to date with that. And I know there's a very strong voice around dark skies in Northampton. Um, at some point, I unfortunately, I had talked about trying to get us together for a site visit to go around the city. Um, with the fellow who works for the city, um, John Fry, who would work with a, a, the instrumentation called the light meter to kind of give us different examples of where there's too much glare, not enough glare, and how that impacts neighborhoods, how that impacts people's feeling of security. So that's something, again, that we could spend a little bit more time on. So when an application comes in front of us, I feel more grounded in kind of responding to their um, request. I know we ran up against that in the recent YMCA application around their lighting and what it meant and where, what, how much flexibility we had in asking them to turn the lights off at a certain point, what that meant to the neighborhood, what that meant to their customers leaving the building. So there's a lot of nuances there too. But, but Caroline, thanks. You've done a great job in keeping all those things kind of um fresh in our minds and an ability to explain them to us yeah the, the, well it reminds me that there is a lighting ordinance update due. Uh, <laughs> i have it out there do so, you okay <laughs> all right um there was one other chat message that came in from Andrew. there's one other thanks <laughs> message that came in while you were talking under um 
uh, sort of following up on the last um, quote text, um, teardowns are more profitable to builders. We are encouraging teardowns, 107 William Street, single family for 208,000, bought by builder with projected eight condo unit for 400K plus, not supporting inclusion. It's not about character, it's about inclusion. Okay. But I think you guys talked about that in your. And inclusion in this sense is meant. That's a bit of a buzzword. I get kind of confused. Is it equity? Is it allowing everybody and anybody to move into my neighborhood? Um, I'm sorry, I can't ask that. What do people take from the word inclusionary? And not. Um, she just texted me again income. People with modest incomes, I guess. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, but I think All you right. did talk yeah. about that in the context of the fact that, you know, 208,000, it was not that in particular example was a shell. So it wasn't move in condition. So it wasn't as though someone could move in and fix it up slowly over time. And it would take another 200,000 to get it to a point yeah. um, where someone could get a certificate of occupancy. Um, and then of course, um, that goes back to your comments, David, I think about, you know, if it's 400,000 in the end per unit, <laughs> does it matter? You know, the impact may be different during the construction and, and how it changes, but, um, right. the well, end result can be the same. Because now we have eight people. Right. Than one. Right. Right. It's better. Eight yeah. opportunities for eight right. um, households. Oh, walk from downtown. Right. Right. To walk and frequent our downtown. Um, there's also a lending issue with that. Um, she can't move into a shell. So because a lender won't, won't um, as far as I know, um, you know, lend money on something that doesn't have a certificate of occupancy. So those, those types of situations would have to be cash buyers as well so uh -huh. um you know there's there's lots of little layers to it all sure i think mean, you have a dynamic i think we see in northampton you see this in a lot of very stable places where people come and stay for a long time is that they bought their house a long time ago and it was like multiple housing cycles back and multiple inflation cycles back right and I think the fact is, if you look at, even though I think the public school teachers should be paid more, if you have a couple, that's two public school teachers, they can afford a much more bigger mortgage than they could in 1982 or whenever. Um, you know, I wish they could afford more, honestly, but um, I think that's the nature of, you know, what Elizabeth Warren calls the, the two income family trap. I mean, things cost more because families have more money than they did. And and again, I'll say that that person who bought the house perhaps 40 years ago at $100,000, now the boom has come. They want to cash out at a, at a rate as high as they can. Um, ideally, they could say to uh, a young family, okay, I'm going to sell it to you for, you know, uh, 150000 because I know you want to make it go, but I'm being offered this over here. Um, so nature as it is, they're going to go for that higher cost. So that higher um, price. It does happen. It's usually their kids, though. So. Right, right. Yeah. For a dollar. Yeah. Um, Carolyn, you mentioned that you were going to give us a little forecast of our next six months, maybe, at the planning board. That's and, so far down the road. Uh, you know. <laughs> um, well, the next month is very light. So no permits have come in. We I know we have a couple of big projects on the cusp of being filed. <laughs> Um, but they're not in yet. So February, there are no permits. We don't actually have it. We won't have a public hearing for the ninth. Okay. Um, so I, the February 23rd, um, in school vacation week, I'm calling cancellation on that, um, meeting, um, to help everyone who's in the system. <laughs> You're in the system. Sure yes. yep. God bless you. You're in the same system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We both have twins. You're in the same grade. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Wow. You occupy multiple. <laughs> um, 
so then so my imagine that in march there'll be one of these bigger projects that will be coming forward if not both uh we we have a couple of zoning um minor zoning amendments plus if i do ever um wrangle that lighting i should put that back on the um front burner um and then yeah so that project on king street ever come back as a permit the one with the robot working, working on it they are still working on it yes yes you mean for a building permit to well i just i had a feeling when it came back it would come back with some uh, amendments because it there certain things seemed infeasible to me but uh that's so hard yeah not, nice. no yeah. um and then um yeah so that uh, there are probably a couple of those bigger projects that'll take us at least till through May, I would think. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah, it's interesting that we uh we often see a lot of applications to come through us and we'll give them an okay and they'll go away and uh nothing materializes. You know, a lot of it is around funding, right? During these uncertain times. And each one of our applications, depending whether it's a site, uh site review or a special permit, they have a different window that they need to initiate building, right? Because I, when I drive around downtown, I sometimes scratch my head and say, geez, I thought that was going to be such and such. And it isn't. There's no hard and fast way to say that an applicant has three years, 36 months. Oh, yeah. So um, COVID disrupted the timelines. So things that um, there was a, there was a, um, an extension of allowances to build out under permits that were granted. Typically, it's a three-year window okay. that you have to substantially start a project. Um, there, we're still probably working off a few of those that were granted just before or during COVID, so they'll have a little bit of a longer window. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, they they would have to come back if it's uh, for an amendment or an extension of permit. All righty. Um, I think we maybe had a set of minutes to approve yeah. from the 12th, the from January 12th. Yeah. That was our discussion of Ferrari. Yeah. Ferrari. <laughs> That's right. All right. Uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes? I think we're supposed to wait at least 90 days before we see the minutes, but I'll approve it anyway. Oh, that's mean. <laughs> it was so quick. I'm like, I remember this. <laughs> All right. Good job. I, I, I move we approve the minutes. Thank you. Is there a second? Thanks, Stacey. Uh, so the motion has been made and approved. Uh, any discussion? All right. All those in favor? Thank you. Um, any other chat messages there that we... Before we close the hearing. All right. So please, um, if, if you have other issues that during our applications, during our regular hearings that come up, we want to have more information about that and you feel it needs some kind of board discussion, please raise that so we can try to do these at times. Um, Carolyn also sent out a great little video link for uh, something that was done by the city around affordable housing. And our friend David played a nice cameo role in that. Did everybody get to look at it? Nice yeah. Yeah. There's... I thought Wayne Wayne did a great job. And Carolyn. And Carol. Yeah. No, no, Carolyn it goes without saying he did a great job. Right? It's hard. No one should ever have to see themselves on a video. It's horrible. <laughs> <laughs> right. There is one other chat comment from a Chris Tate, he says, move to adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Chris. Most has been made to adjourn at 810? 809. 809. Is I'll second it. Most has made it seconded. Okay, all those in favor? All right. Thank you for coming in tonight, folks. Braving that storm from yesterday. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah.